Uh, we are together studying the book of Proverbs. We've been doing that since 2016, and we are in Proverbs chapter 19 this morning, beginning in verse 22. And going through verse 26, we'll see if we can get there today. I'm going to give you a couple of texts. I don't like to do this often because uh, I notice that people here don't take a lot of notes. But uh, these uh, texts are very important. I think they will add to, give color to, if you will, uh, the Proverbs that we're studying. And so I want you to set a tab, two places, Genesis 48 and Psalm 28. And I think they will uh, add to our Proverbs this morning. So here is our translation, 1922. What people desire in a person is... His unfailing kindness, better to be a poor person than a liar. 23, I'm just going to read the top line. The fear of the Lord is surely life. Because the second half, that second part of that proverb is very difficult. And so, uh, believe me, what, what I would read to you, you don't have. Um, and we'll get into the detail of line two. But this is a very difficult proverb. It's very difficult because of the translation of verse two, and it has a large interpretive question. So 23 is very hard. 24, the sluggard buries his hand in the dish. He does not return it to his mouth. 25, flog a mocker, and the gullible will become prudent. 26, the one who ruins his father driving out his mother is a shameful and disgraceful son. Now here is the way I'm going to teach these proverbs. 22, the best condition in life is dependence upon the Lord. The best condition in life is dependence upon the Lord. 23, spiritual life is empowerment from the inside. both in this life and beyond. Let me read that again. Spiritual life is empowerment from the inside, both in this life and beyond. 24. Sloth is not meeting the moment. Sloth is not meeting the moment. 25. The prudent is the one who knows. The prudent is the one who knows. And finally, 26. Behold the destruction of the home. Behold the destruction of the home. Well, beginning in verse 22 this morning, here is our exposition. What people desire in a person. This top line opens the skill for living with the practice of hesed. Covenant faithfulness, covenant loyalty, loyal love. We can't define it in English. There are so many ways to describe one word. It's the word from above. 
it, we, we just can't get our brain around it in totality. But it's what we are to practice. Covenant faithfulness. We are to practice it to the poor, particularly to the weak. It is the practice of kindness. It is the practice of grace. And what we can understand about grace. Look, this opening, what people desire. That word desire is the same word as Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6. The woman in the garden looking at the fruit. A delight to the eyes and there's our word, desired. The idea is we wish people to treat us that way. With kindness. With generosity. To show us good. And we're always so impressed when people do. Because people like that are very rare in our lives. Now here's the second line. To underscore a second truth. I want you to notice it's a better than proverb. So we're on a logical trek. We're thinking our way through style-wise. A poor person is a destitute individual in the ancient world. He's passed over. He's passed by the masses. That was the trifle of verse 17 a couple of lessons back. There was no refuge for a person like that in the ancient world. There was no government programs, no soup kitchens, no nothing. They were absolutely on their own. And yet this individual, having nothing, the proverb tells us, is better than a liar. Now we've studied the liar in the past. And what did we learn? That the liar has no escape. There's no place for him to run and hide. Now he may get ultimately through this life. Time most often is against him. But he may die with his lie. But then he faces the Lord Jesus. And what then? What then? Matthew 12, 36, our Lord says, by your words you'll be judged. By your very words. And they'll burn up before you. See, He has ultimately no place to run and no place to hide. The noose is around His neck and it grows tighter and tighter. We are to confess our sins to one another. And He is there to forgive us and accept us. But for the liar, he has no place, no refuge. He has nothing. Better to be a poor person in space and time who trusts God for His provision than for a liar. Now here's 23. And this is the difficult one. The fear of the Lord is surely life. Now it's line two that is so hard. Let's go through this slowly. Line two, the NIV, if that's your translation, says then one. If you have an English standard version and whoever. The New American Standard makes it a purpose clause. So that. And if you have a King James it is personal identification. And he who. Now my translation reads this. Fully satisfied, he dwells not yet with harm. I know you don't have that translation. It's very wooden, but I can account for every word. So I'm sure your final clause reads something like this. Rest content, untouched by trouble, are rest satisfied, not visited or harmed by evil. So what's this proverb really saying to us? Well, line one is rather easy. 
And we've quoted it often, have we not? The fear of the Lord, the man who fears the Lord, says Charles Bridges, has nothing in life to fear. It's His sovereignty over us. It is His providence that takes us day to day. It's the picture of Psalm 91 verse 1. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. So there He is dwelling in the secret place of the Most High. And we, it's the imagery of the children of Israel in the wilderness. And we shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Now, let's think about that for a second. What's that shadow? Well, that shadow was the cloud. The cloud that led them. They followed the cloud. And in the night, when it was cold in the wilderness, the cloud would heat up. It was like an electric blanket over them and kept them from freezing. And the cloud covered them in the daytime in the heat of the desert so that they remained comfortable and cool. That was the cloud. That's the idea here. So the top line is telling us the benefits of daily walking, daily practicing the fear of the Lord. And it leads us surely to life. Now life is the interpretive question. What are we talking about here in the proverb? It can refer to life in space and time. Here's Proverbs 31.12, the virtuous woman all the days of her life. Here, space and time. 14.30, we have life to the body. That's physical well-being. Proverbs 3.2, length of days and years of life. So, the Proverbs teach it can easily be physical life. And we even think outside the Proverbs of a text that we're all familiar with, Genesis 50, verse 20. It is the monumental text of divine providence of Joseph saying to his brothers, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And here's the purpose. The purpose clause to Genesis 50.20. I like the New American Standard here. To this present result, the preservation of life. There it is. Physical life. So what happened to Joseph is to preserve life. Physical life. All of those pagans in the land of Canaan, they could come to Egypt and be fed. All the Egyptians, the idolatrous Egyptians, could all be fed. And Joseph says, that's a good thing. We run into fiery buildings to rescue people. That's a good thing because we believe in life. And we stand for life. So, that is good. And that is life. But there's also a second interpretation that makes this proverb so difficult. Is it physical life? Or is it spiritual life? We have observed in the past as we've gone through the proverbs, the wellspring the wellspring of life. It's the idea of an endless supply of water coming up from the center of the earth. John 4.13 It was on the mind of our Lord Jesus. Everyone who drinks the water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water that I give will become in them a spring of water. Water welling up to eternal life. So, the image of water was really spiritual, according to the Lord Jesus. 
So here specifically, I take this spiritually as the spiritual life, not the physical life. And here's why. Because look at the look at the connection, the fear of the Lord. What's the fear of the Lord? Spiritual life. It is life here and now with vitality spiritually. The outward man is wasting away. The inward man is being refreshed and renewed daily. Spiritually, we are being built up through this Word as we hear the voice of the Great Shepherd. So I take it to be the fear of the Lord, which was the Old Testament version of the New Testament doctrine that we understand walking in the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5. The immediate context guides my interpretation. There. Now, line 2. The life benefit... And I have fully satisfied, depicting the wise man's day. The phrase means being full of something. Think of something you can measure. And it dwells. The New American Standard mentions sleep, peace, rest, contentment. That's the idea. So that one may sleep satisfied. There it is. In the translation, dwelling in peace. And let's just take the New American Standard idea of the implications of that. Dwelling in the night. Restful. See that in the Old Testament, the night was the time of danger. We have two examples of that in the Old Testament. Genesis 19, the angels coming to Sodom, attacked in the night. We think of uh, Judges 19, where the Levite concubine was raped and killed. Killed in the night. Both stories regarding travelers who lodged at night in a strange place. Both stories depict the will, uh, the will of evil men that comes. But the evil is there, and it's frightening, and it comes in the night. Here, the idea is protection, sovereign, divine protection. And so, my translation has not yet with harm. Now, that's translated in the King James and the New American Standard as evil. That's the word, ra. It's evil. But if you look at it from the lexicon, from the scholars who deal with the nuances of the language, they translate ra differently. And here's where you find it. And that's why I wanted you to set a tab at Genesis 48. Genesis 48, 16. It is Jacob's blessings to Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. This is a monumental text in the Old Testament. I wish I had an hour to talk about it, and you're glad that I don't. But it has a promise. It has a benediction. It has images. It is... A grand canyon of color in it. Here it is. 48.16 May the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been the sh my shepherd all the days of my life, the angel who redeemed me, and here is our word from Proverbs 19.23. The lexicon translates it, misery, injury, distress. And so I translated it not yet with harm. The idea is to be met with trouble. 
So, harm ends the proverb, a reference to calamity, to disaster. In other words, the fear of the Lord is your guide and He is your protector. And that's our word Lord right there. The covenant name. The name that said to Moses in the midst of his weakness on the Midian desert, I will be with you. Now, why is that so significant for you and me? We're not on the Midian desert. Oh, but yes, we are. Because you see, Jesus says it to us in Matthew 28, 20. I will be with you through the desert experience of life. And then He ends with this. Even to the end of the age. Now what does that mean? The end of the age. Well, it means life beyond the grave. That's what it means. That He's waiting there to receive us. I go and prepare a place for you. Your life doesn't end in a grave, in a casket. No. Your life goes on and on. That's the idea. That's really what's happening here. And so it's a difficult proverb. Let me summarize it this way. You, you belong to the Lord. You're His property. Both here, now, life, space and time. But more than that, you belong to Him beyond the grave. Beyond this life. That's the idea. So, how then should we live? Well, here's what the apostles tell us. It's in your eating. It's in your drinking. It's in your associations. It's in living your life. And you do it all to the glory of God because He's the one that gave you the life. So, you shine. You're salt. You're light. And people see it. And they go, that person is so different. And God is glorified by that. The Westminster Confession tells us the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Here's 24. The sluggard buries his hand in the dish. He doesn't return it to his mouth. It's a very visual proverb. It's sarcastic. The sluggard, a fool so lazy, unable to muster enough energy to even send his hand to his mouth to feed himself. The sluggard, the term is used 13 times in the Old Testament and all right here in the book of Proverbs. Synonyms, sluggish, slow, lazy, slothful. In 18.9, he is slack in his work. In 21.17, he is a man of want. The picture in the top line is joined by the second. See, he's starving. He's a pathetic figure. And here's the action, which is a joke in itself. He buries his hand. Now, that's an interesting word. That word buried is used in Joshua chapter 2 of Rahab burying or hiding, we would say, the spies in Jericho. That's our word. And he sticks his hand in a dish, but it's not a dish like we think about, a bowl. No, it's a flat pan, or flat surface. Now, if you think about it, 
If it's a bull, it takes more energy. You have to twist your wrists. You have to move your fingers around in a bowl, but not a flat surface. It's just one movement. One movement right here. Now, I know it's ridiculous, but see, that's what Solomon wants to paint for us. That picture. Line 2 does not return. In other words, no action, no participation. His hand is in the flat surface of the pan. And then it just stays there. So here's the proverb. Despite the opportunity that he has, he wastes it. And he starves. In other words, he alone is the one who suffers for his lack of energy. The proverb, notice, does not say. The proverb doesn't say that he's too lazy to cook it. That he's too lazy and indolent to pour it into the pan, the dish. No, all of that has been provided. Look at the proverb again. It's all there, waiting for him. The point is, he's simply too lazy to meet the moment. And when I saw that, I realized I've got a problem. I've got a problem. And you see, that's the sluggard. Proverbs 20, verse 4, when opportunity knocks, he does nothing. Um, he has daily chores, but in 26, 13, and 14, he doesn't get out of bed because he's got an imaginary lion in the street. And so he puts it off and he just keeps turning in his bed because there's imaginary lion is out there. He squanders his time. He squanders his opportunity. Now, this isn't you, but this is me. I put things off. You don't do that. I do that. I go, I'll, I'll deal with that later. I don't want to think about it right now. Say, I don't like doing my taxes. I'm doing that. And uh, I, I just really rather put it out of my mind. It's much more pleasant and enjoyable for me to study. I'm like that. You're not like that. But I'm like that. I put things off. And to that extent, I'm the sluggard. Because I squander my time and I wait and I waste my opportunity. Here's 25. Flog the mocker and the gullible. Your translation may read simple or naive. Will, your translation may have gain. It is really the word that we use for becoming, to become prudent. Line two, if one corrects, you may have reprove, you may have rebuke. The insightful, he discerns knowledge. Now, here's the proverb. It addresses the difficult job of educating the fool. The fool is the intractable mocker our proverb is essentially the same in 21.11. When a mocker is punished, the simple game wisdom. By paying attention to the wise, they gain or become knowledgeable. Our opening word here in the top line is to flog, meaning to strike, to smite. It, we do that to deviant behavior. That is one who is consumed with himself. And that's the mocker. It's all about me. Life is me. Not you, me. And that's the mocker. That's the 
the fool, Psalm 1. Uh, that first line of the psalm is St. Bonaventure. Uh, back in the medieval times, it saw that walking, standing, sitting was a progression. It's a declension. Man's going down. And the ultimate is that he's a mocker. The lowest form of the fool. The hardened fool. The educational situation here is that he's punished. Now, you see the word and? That's in your King James. That's very important because it introduces for us the consequence. So the gullible, think of the raw youth, the mildest form of the fool here. Gullible. He is capable of being shaped, being inspired, and being somewhat improved. And here he observed, he experiences the penalty of the mocker. He hears it. He sees it. He sees the orange jumpsuit. He sees the handcuffs behind the back. That's what he sees. That's what he observes. And it, according to the proverb, it makes a strong impression upon him. It's described as gaining or becoming. Becoming a word of identification, of transformation. Prudent. Look at that. To grasp the meaning or the implication of the message. The ability to understand. We've used it over and over again to interpret Joseph as he stood before Pharaoh and interpreted the dream. It was prudent. He put things together. Line two, if one corrects, that uh, corrects is, means to reprove. We say, oh, I got into trouble for that. Well, that's reprove. That's what the word means. It's idiomatic for correction. And it's used by Abraham in Genesis 21-25 because Abraham's servants had seized his wells. They had stolen his water wells. And he confronts Abimelech about it. Now, insightful here. Your translation may have discerning, understanding, knowledgeable. It is the penetrating mind that can distinguish between right and wrong. Knowing moral order. That's the idea. This is the person that can connect the dots. The fool can't do that. Look, the wise he discerns, meaning he knows, he understands. Now, I want to give it to you in the negative because I think it'll lift the concept off the page for you. And that's why I wanted you to set a tab at Psalm 28. It's Psalm 28, verses 4 and 5. I want you to see this. David is petitioning the Lord, Psalm 28, 4 and 5, he's petitioning the Lord, give to the wicked according to their deeds. You see that? The work of their hands. What they have done, deal with them because of what they did, said David. Now look at verse 5. Here's why. They did not discern they did not regard. They cared nothing for the work of the Lord's hands. See, they don't know. They don't understand. Man, man doesn't understand how destructive sin is. He knows if he touches the hot stove, his hand will be burned. But he doesn't understand the destruction of it all. Discernment. Knowledge. That's what's at the heart. And that's at the heart for you and me. Um, 
I think of a text like uh, Ephesians chapter 1, that long sentence of the apostle, remember? And, uh, and he comes to verse 17, and he says, may give you the spirit of wisdom that you might know. In the Greek text, it is the Spirit. Meaning, the Holy Spirit from the outside. This is not the man being made teachable on the inside. No, the action is happening upon the man, and it is by the Spirit that comes down upon him. And the Apostle wants that Spirit, the Spirit, to train you and me in wisdom and in knowledge. So, it's not that we're going to be made teachable or we have an attitude of being taught. No, this is His teaching us. It's the definite article. And here's what He wants us to know. Revelation. Unveiling. Apocalypse. So, how does the Apostle lay that out for us there at the beginning of Ephesians? Well, it's in three ways. Remember? It's the past. From eternity past. You were chosen. Then it's here in space and time. This is what we know. This is what we understand. This is the way we are to live for His glory. And then the third part here, it is the future. It's glory. That's where we're headed. We're headed for glory. Now, that's what the apostle wanted them to know from knowledge, from discernment. Now, I want you to look at the latter part of verse 5. Right there, Psalm 28. Torn down, never to be rebuilt. Let me, let me give you a living illustration of that so that it's concrete in your mind. Back in the 1930s, when the Nazis all sat around in their brand new uniforms and boots, and they, they, they planned out their administration, they came to the subject of the Jews. And uh, they were going to annihilate them. They were going to torture them. They were going to imprison them. They were going to starve them. That's the final solution. That's what we're going to do with them. And interestingly enough, nobody said, wait a minute here. You know, like they do in business meetings. You know, wait a minute. Now, what are we, what are we doing here? Nobody did that. Nobody said, now, look, these are God's chosen people. They came from Abraham. He gave them promises they were given to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and to the nation. He, he took them out of Egypt. He gave them a land. And He sent His own Son, the Messiah, to that land, to those people. And they rejected Him. And therefore, He cut them off. And He spread them across the face of the earth. And some of those people are our citizens. They're German citizens. They're here in our land. But gentlemen, we can't do this. The God of glory will chase us down. He'll hunt us down. He'll punish us. You see... You, what you don't understand, what you're not thinking through here, is that we're in a parenthesis in time. It's called the, the period of the Gentiles. When the b dividing wall that separated the Jew and the, the Gentile, it's torn down. And now they're, they're one people. Right now. It's a parenthesis. But that parenthesis is going to come to an end. It's called... 
the fullness of the Gentiles. Think of that black line in the swimming pool. You know, it, the water gets up to that line. And that's it. In the fullness of the Gentiles, and someday, sometime, in God's plan, in His mind, that line is going to hit the crest. And that's it. And then, and then God, in His plan and purpose, He's going to turn around back to them, His people. And He's going to fulfill the promises that He gave to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, somehow, some way, somehow, the Messiah is going to sit upon that throne of David and He's going to rule the world from Jerusalem. But you see, nobody said that, did they? Nobody said, oh, the fear of God has fallen upon us. What are we doing? What are we thinking? They didn't do that, did they? And what happened? Second part of verse 5. That's what happened. Torn down, never to be rebuilt. They became like every regime and every nation in the world. Destroyed. Why? Because they did not discern. They did not have the knowledge of the revelation of God. The very thing that the Apostle wants for you and me. You know, as long as these elders are here at Believer's Chapel, you're going to study this revelation because in their minds, as in the apostles' minds, that's what invigorates you. That's what changes you. That's what causes you to grow and be vital. It brings contentment. It brings peace. Just the opposite of what the Roman church bring, brings to people. See, they want to keep you busy. You're on the squirrel cage, running all the time. Light a candle for this. Build a new image for that. Make a new saint for this. A saint for that. Build a new cathedral. And by all means, come to the Mass because the Mass is binding. You won't be saved without it. You see, there's no peace in that. It's just all activity. You're just always doing but not the believer. The believer, he is at peace. He is at rest. Because his salvation is not found in the church. His salvation is found in the Savior, his Lord. And so what we do at Believer's Chapel we practice the sacraments, baptism, the Lord's table, but they are the means. The means to make you, sanctify you, through His Word, conform you so that you go out and live and glorify Him. That's the difference. That's what we have. The knowledge of God. And that knowledge saves. Blessed is the person that knows that and understands it because it is eternal life and it is perseverance and peace and security that this world cannot and will not understand. That's our proverb. Let's close in a word of prayer. Thank You, Father, for the teaching ministry of the Word. Thank You for the leadership of this church. 
thank you that they know, they understand, and they are giving us the very best of what we need. A full education in the revelation of the Son who spoke to us and who said, I go and prepare a place for you. And if it were not so, I would have told you, but I have told you. And so our focus and our eyes are on Him always, seeing like Moses the invisible because He speaks to us through His Word. Bless us to that end. Guide, guard, and direct us to that end. For You are the God of sovereignty and providence that protects us through the wilderness, through the experiences of life, and puts us over Your shoulder and carries us to eternity. It's all of You and none of us.